There's a lot of writers on the internet, so how do you stand out? You need this asset that shows you know more and care more than your competition and you give it away for free because people go, oh no, I will never give my best ideas away for free. But what happens is this free product, whatever you make, a video, uh, an ebook, whatever, this demonstrates that you're worth investing in so that when you do come to release something else, you're not there trying to push and persuade people, you just invite them to invest. Kieran Drew quit his job as a dentist to pursue his passion for writing. Now he has an audience of over 185,000 people, a newsletter called Digital Freedom, and he recently made six figures in just four days. In this episode of Creators on Air, Kieran shares how to stand out as a writer, build trust with your audience, and create an offering that builds your business. There was a long period of time where I was like, I know I wasn't happy at den- uh, as a dentist, but I, I, I couldn't work out what else to do. And so my version was, you know, double down on working and then hopefully retire early, you know, get to like 40 and and then work it out. And uh, when COVID hit, suddenly, you know, a lot of time to think. And it was pretty uncomfortable because I was like, well, this plan is pretty stupid. And uh, someone sent me Naval Ravikant who just said, you know, there's this alternate path to to building wealth and happiness, which is along the lines of uh, building online, attract an audience, build a product, this sort of path. And yeah, it was pretty wild because, you know, quite humbling to to start again from scratch particularly like dentistry was going pretty well and the, the first step was that whole exploring your curiosity uh, and seeing what you find so my idea was uh first off to become a stand-up comic because I thought what a brilliant way to make like a living right just making people laugh <laughs> and uh for better or worse uh it was still lockdown so I never actually made it into the clubs which I don't know uh, <laughs> it could have been good but um I actually found writing when I was writing the jokes and I was like, wow, this skill is just incredible, um, very energizing, really fun. And, and and so I sort of pivoted and thought, well, how can we just start writing more? And and then there was maybe a year where I was fascinated by the topic, but absolutely sucked. And it was an interesting balance because, um, you know, I, I went back to my nine to five. I was working six days a week, but every early morning I was like, Look, if I could write for two hours a day in the morning, um, do my like social media at lunch and then read an hour at night. Hopefully something's going to happen. And uh, that was about a year, a uh, thousand followers after a year, which was pretty rough. Uh, and then it all just started kicking off around um, August, 2021. And how did you choose where you were going to write and what you were going to write about at that point when you were still so early in that journey? Yeah, I mean, for the most part, I tried out everything. So I'm a big fan of experimenting and this is one reason it took, you know, a year to get a thousand followers. Uh, I just started picking platforms and the main mistake I made uh, was I tried to do it all right. So I was mm. writing on Instagram. I started a newsletter that my mum and my girlfriend read and that was about it. <laughs> uh, we had Reddit um, and, and a couple others. And then I stumbled across Twitter. And it's funny because when I first heard of Twitter, I was like, this can't be right because I thought it was about, you know, sports commentary. And people were talking about copywriting. I thought that was for lawyers. And uh, anyway, I, I came over and around August or maybe just a month before, I realized, yeah, it's very difficult to to grow if you're not kind of narrowing down, right? So if you try to grow everywhere, you grow nowhere. And the thing with Twitter that was really cool was the the attitude just seemed to be really five, 10 years ahead in terms of knowledge and also just this perspective on business. And, you know, so for example, I was writing on Medium and all of the like, back end of it people are going how can i make a hundred dollars per article and then on twitter it, like the, the basic question is like how do i make 10k a month and you know really really fond of this idea about environment and i was like well this seems to be the place to be um so i just stopped doing absolutely everything and went all in uh over on twitter after but even on twitter i feel like there's so many writers there at the moment so how how did you stand out uh I tweet at a time I think so I didn't stand out <laughs> for a long time uh yeah the problem with writing on social media is that when you start you have all these intentions to be unique and then you realize that it's algorithm based and if you say a certain thing it'll get a certain amount of engagement and if you're not careful before you know it you're pumping out platitudes and there's no kind of uniqueness to it and mm. I was going down that route uh what happened was um for some reason I told myself at the start I would never write about myself so people don't want to hear about you. They want to hear about what you know. And that's a complete opposite to my message now, right? And so in August, 2021, I posted a uh, story about myself, which is the first time I'd written about myself. And it was just, um, you know, some, some neck issue that I had and what I had learned. 
And I actually wrote this thread three months before. I never posted it because I was like, who the hell cares? And my girlfriend was like, you should really send this because like, it's pretty good. And anyway, I click send, uh, you know, logged off, came out the next day, tripled the audience, like 400 DMs. And what wow. I realized was um, it's like storytelling slices through the noise, right? Like people are always being told what to do and, and, and what stories is actually doing is you're showing them. Like you're not going, here's how to, it's how I. And when I was thinking about it, I was like, well, what's the stuff that really interests me? And I, I love it when someone builds in public because that's like a story in real time, right? You you say mm-hmm. you're going to do something, you share how it goes better or worse. Like I've, <laughs> it's not gone well for a lot of my stuff. And I've been very open about that. And that was how I shifted my branding where I was like, look, let's just make this a build in public project where I share what I learn, share what I do. And, um, I think from there, it really just started to build a great bond with the audience and, and things started kicking off. Yeah, definitely. Even on your newsletter that you, that's got so many subscribers, what do you think helped to grow that list as well? Yeah, a couple of things. So a lot of people ask me, uh, how do you come up with newsletter ideas and when do you start? So the, the first bit of advice for that is don't start until you know your niche and you know what you want to achieve or else it's really hard to keep pivoting. So that was my mistake. So I had a First year, I maybe got a hundred subs. Then, what you know, for the for the newsletter? The best newsletter to build is the one that would impact you the most personally, right? Like you write selfishly. So what I did was I sucked at Twitter like really bad, and so I made a newsletter called Fire Tweet Friday, where I would deconstruct why tweets work. And you know, uh, I was very very interested in copywriting, so it's a really cool way to to apply what I was learning and and then attract people that thought just like me. Yeah. And I've basically followed that model ever since, right? Like um, I'm not writing, I'm writing for Kieran Drew, right? And I try to challenge myself to think through ideas better, come up with better frameworks, execute better. Um, I feel like the reputation from that has been really cool. Uh, you know, I do like a monthly business report where I share all my numbers and what I'm working on and why I'm worried and all these things. And I think that helps it stand out. The other side of it, uh, Acta, was um, I, I made a lot of free courses. So what I realized early was, I mean, the writing niche, right? It's very, very busy. Yeah. And I, yeah, I'm looking at people like Dickie or Dan, uh, Dan Co. And I'm thinking, I can never compete with these guys, uh, at least not playing that game. And so I decided to shift the metric and think, well, how much value can I give away for free? Because, you know, I could defer monetization a bit, but also I was terrified to monetize. So this is quite a nice plan to push it off. And so I made maybe four or five courses, um, full video wow. courses, really high quality. And they've been downloaded about 35,000 times wow. uh, all in all. So, you know, they give me the email for that. You do get quite a high churn when you build an email list that way. But that's cool because the people that hang around obviously watch the courses and then they keep reading the newsletter. Yeah. And I also love how you always end your newsletters with like a picture of you as well. Like it makes it a little bit more like personal and real. Like what is your reasoning behind doing things like that? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Well, again, two things here. So one of the smartest things you can do as a creator is pay attention to what gets your attention. And there's an uh, email marketer called Justin Goff who does this, right? And what I noticed was I would open all of his emails and quite often it would be to see his picture at the bottom and just think, what's that guy written (laughs) on the side? And, you know, look around, no one else is doing it. Um, You know, this whole like still like an artist concept. It's not something you trademark, right? And I thought, well, let's just do the same. Um, the second part of it is the difficulty as a writer compared to other content creators is that you don't really put your face out there too much. Mm -hmm. And it's actually quite hard to build a bond with someone through writing alone, unless you're very talented at writing. And so what what I do is that, you know, by by sharing what you look like, um, it just has this friendly, familiar feel. And it really plays into this idea of, you know, being the guide and not the guru. Um, It's like, this is a real person. Like it's not, like a tacky sign right like i'm in my flat like it's not really like highly edited and stuff and it's just a very nice small tweak that i think is a great differentiator on a long-term time frame no definitely i agree with you i think it definitely makes you stand out in like all the newsletters that i receive um and i think it's really refreshing that you're focused you know a lot on storytelling and building that personal connection um so how important do you think things are like because a lot of the things that you read on Twitter is, you know, have a good hook or have a good title for your newsletter so that, you know, people will click on it. How important are those things? For Twitter, extremely. For newsletter, not as much as people think. So oh, right. uh, let me explain. Um, the thing with the newsletter, yes, a great subject line is cool. 
But what you'll find is that people generally will open emails if you over deliver in the email, right? Like uh, if you just think about who you consume, right? If you read a, if you read a bad email, you don't care about the subject line round two, right? You're like, oh, I'm not going to open that regardless. Mm. You read an email that feels like it's written for you. So it's personalized. True. It's interesting. You're like, you could just write whatever you want. So, um, you know, my open rate is pretty, it's pretty steady the whole way along. However, on Twitter, it's a different ball game, right? Because when someone gives you an email, it's very personal. And it's all about connection. Social media is like a live auction of attention, right? People vote with likes, retweets, impressions, all that stuff. And so yeah. um, the competition for attention is, is is much more serious. And so your hook is everything, right? That doesn't mean that you have to write these super cheesy, you know, 12 websites that are so good they should be illegal sort of stuff. <laughs> um my my rule is basically, uh, you know, reputation is always number one. And yeah, I've broken that rule a couple of times. Like I've written the morning thread and the morning routine thread and all these things. But um, you just want to be able to make a hook. Uh, so what I teach in my course is that clear, concise, and it's curious, right? So there has to be some form of intrigue. And intrigue is generally what's in it for me, the benefit of the hook. Uh, it has to be concise, right? Because if you see a hook and it's like a wall of text, you're not going to read the next bit because you were like, before we read, we assess if it's worth our time. Mm -hmm. And if you make the first hook looks like a mess and you're not going to read the thread. And then the clearness, it's it's more about uh, who are you writing to? So like, it's, it's very clear who this is for and what you're going to get out of it. So sometimes people try to be a bit too clever, I think, with their copy. And so my checklist is literally when I write a hook, it's like, is it clear? Is it concise? Is it curious? And that seems to work pretty well. Mm, definitely. And you spoke about, you know, directly speaking to the person as well. So for emails, do you kind of segment your newsletter list? Like, do you have that kind of structure or is it just sending emails to everyone? I do it very, very basically. Uh, I think the simplicity scales, right? And I don't think you need to mess around with this sort of stuff until you're building a seven figure business. You know, I've made many mistakes and, and always looking back, it's when I'm tweaking stuff that doesn't really matter. So mm. for, for my emails, uh, it is pretty basic. I have tagging based on behavior. Someone clicks the link on business, they get tagged interested in business, clicks the link on copy, all this sort of oh, stuff. Right. That's okay, but I think you're meant to be doing it a bit different. I'm not a pro on that stuff. And um, when I'm doing stuff like product launches, I will ask people to join a waiting list because I don't want to bombard my whole list. Right. Um, and that's pretty much the only differentiator I do. Um, what does your current business look like? So what are your revenue streams? Yeah, so we have the, well, kind of ironically right now, not not much revenue coming in because uh, I just released my uh, flagship product, which was called High Impact Writing. And that came out in May. And it was pretty wild. Like we made um, 140K in four days. Wow. Which was, yeah, which was class. Like I, I did not expect that. I was expecting it to be like a 10x result. Um, but that's not for sale anymore for a couple more months. And so basically the way that I'm making money at the moment is we are doing a bit of affiliating. So when I'm writing a newsletter, if there is an, I don't really like write an email about something, but you know, let's say I'm talking about email, I'll mention ConvertKit because, you know, very, very fond of it and kind of following along those sort of plans. Mm -hmm. uh, I stopped advertising on the newsletter, but I made a, a fair bit of money with that. I also have another product called the Viral Inspiration Lab, which again, isn't for sale because I'm fixing the funnel. And the other thing that I do sell is a, a group coaching. So before I launched the product, I launched like a beta coaching to test the ideas and get uh, testimonials. And at the end of it, uh, that finished at the start of January. And I, and I offered to these guys, do you want to carry on on like a continuity pay? And uh, they all said yes. So that's been about 3K a month. And I'm just waiting for them to stop, basically. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Uh, it, it's brilliant. Uh, but, but like uh, the, the main focus by the end of the year is to have uh, a couple of products and a monthly payment uh, and, and then advertising. And then the rest is just scaling free writing. Wow. That's amazing. And you mentioned earlier that you stood out by having you know like the free courses and things like that so how do you know when you know it's time to create kind of a, a lead magnet that's free versus creating a paid product and creating a new revenue stream how do you distinguish between the two sure the unfortunately there's no cookie cut answer here uh, but the conversation i have all the time is this distinction between nice versus necessary and the problem online is that most of the time we get stuck chasing nice things, just shiny objects, and we don't really execute the necessary, right? 
And so the way I look at the creator business, we have three components. We have reach, we have relationships, and we have revenue. Reach, the necessary is one social media channel, right? Uh, or you're paying for ads, which are like one way to get more customers. Obviously, as writers, I say very bullish on the audience side of things. But one thing I'm not bullish on is when people think the necessary is four or five social media channels. Mm -hmm. because um, you know, people go, oh, you know, it only takes five minutes to grow on two accounts. And it's a complete lie, right? Because you have to engage, you've got all the split focus, you don't know who you write to anymore. So one social media channel. For relationships, it's funny because it's the most ignored, but most important. And the reason being is that followers and dollars are very easy to track, right? Grow your audience, build, build stuff to sell to them. But it's actually like the creative business is a relationship business and trust is everything. And so... I always say, um, first and foremost, we need the newsletter. That's a trust building mechanism for your writing, but also building an authority asset, the lead magnet. I think that's a necessary thing. You need this asset that shows you know more and care more than your competition and you give it away for free, okay? Because uh, people go, oh no, I will never give my best ideas away for free. But what happens is this free product, whatever you make, a video, uh, an ebook, whatever, this demonstrates that you're worth investing in. Mm -hmm. so that when you do come to release something else you're not there trying to push and persuade people you just invite them to invest so it's necessary if you haven't got one then it should be one of your like priority lists and obviously with revenue it sounds really stupid but um you need an offer like i can't tell you how long i spent worrying about how i was going to make money online and i'm talking like i quit my job in september i didn't monetize for six months but I wanted to. And I just wish someone came back and slapped Kieran around the face and said, build something to sell. <laughs> yeah. And so, yeah, once you take off those three things, uh, then you can start playing around with, can you build more assets, more courses? But I think a, an honest review of your business and just saying like reach, relationships, revenue, are these ticked off? If not, pick one, do it, and you'll find that there are other two catch up as a result. I love that. I love that you've given it like the three hours as well, because I think that's memorable. Um, how did you decide on what your offering was? You know, you said, you said that you left a job and then there was that time that you weren't monetizing. I think that's what a lot of creators can struggle with. It's like, how do I monetize? So how, how can people figure out what they should offer? Yeah, originally I wanted to be a copywriter just to give some context. I wanted to be a freelance copywriter and there was, uh, you know, I was very, very motivated, quit my job, made a tweet, building in public, everyone watch out, I'm going to be the best copywriter in the world. And <laughs> two months later, I had to write a thread being why I'd failed to find a single client. And the reason being that it wasn't for me, like the energy wasn't there. It felt like I was going from job to job and I quit my job to teach, right? I find it very energizing to help other people with ideas that I believe in and seeing that make an impact. And so I think that's the first question is, do you want to do it or do you want to teach it? Now, if you want to teach something, you have to have some result to teach, right? The best way to do that is to look back at a problem that you have already solved and then think well how can I package this up into a solution mm -hmm. so for me I've been writing for a while and one thing I really struggled with was writer's block and then I asked my audience what they all struggled with and they all said the same and I was like brilliant well let's go uh, build something to solve that and so I, I made a swipe file and you know gave it a fancy name gave it gave it a mechanism you know the whole like three R stuff you need to make stuff stand out and then I released that and just said hey look I love writing this is what I use to overcome writer's block if you if you have if you struggle with that too come and get it and the thing about the first product or the first offer is people you overthink it because you're chasing perfection right but it, it just needs to be published not perfect because actually the product or whatever you release is it's a reputation building asset just as much as revenue so you know the first launch made four or five k which at the time by the way was sweeter than anything dentistry had ever made because i've been working so long for it yeah because i had solved a specific problem in my niche i was able to move on to the next level and um it was kind of like the cascade so when a creator says like well what do i do if you just write about what fascinates you you'll attract people who are fascinated by the same stuff ask them a problem that they're struggling with and see if you've struggled with that problem too. If you can't pick a problem, like from your personal experience, go solve one for them and then you have a solution and then it's about marketing. And once you've come up with your solution and you know what your offering is, how do you know how much to value it for? Yeah, again, not an expert when it comes to business, uh, but I will give you some personal experiences. Uh, first product I released, absolutely terrified that no one would buy it. And so what I did was I, Launched for eighty dollars, uh, but with a special fifty percent discount at launch to make that whatever for forty bucks, and that's pretty cool because you get all this urgency and the scarcity and, and all that stuff. What I will say, I mean, for a first pricing strategy, 
it's kind of smart because it gets stuff going, but you run the risk of devaluing yourself. And so you have to think, first and foremost, what are you confident with charging? Because on Twitter, you know, the advice is you've got to be charging super high ticket, never devalue yourself and all these things. I'm actually the opposite. I feel like money isn't the problem for creators, it's momentum. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you charge how much you believe you can help. And I think you do that one win at a time, right? So when I started coaching, I started for free. Then I sold 10 hours of calls for $500. And that was to a friend. So he's either very smart or very evil. Um, <laughs> and now, you know, I charge 500 minimum for one call. So start small and scale fast is kind of my advice. If you're not sure, it's always easier to undercharge and move up as opposed to overcharge and move down. So mm -hmm. Yeah. And I mean, there's quite a lot of people who offer things like writing courses and, you know, coaching. Do you think as a creator, it's important to make the product or like the service stand out? Or is it more you as a creator and your content standing out? Oh, that's a good one. <laughs> I'm going to have to cop out and say it's both. I, okay. I, think, um, I think you should make one a priority because it's much easier to get results on one thing and use that momentum to propel the other. So for example, mm -hmm. if someone builds an excellent service offer, they have the reputation and results to them when they start building an audience, people have a reason to pay attention from day one. Yeah. Um, you know, I see a lot of people that from the copywriting world that are writing on Twitter, they grow really fast because, you know, they're actually making money unlike a lot of writers on Twitter who we all pretend to be, right? Um, we've all been there. <laughs> um, on the flip side, I went for the brand first approach. And the reason why I like this one, Acto, is because I didn't know what to build. Yeah. And so if you can, you know, focus on the writing, build a great relationship with your audience, prove that you're here to make a difference and not just make money, then when you come to build the product, you can, um, you know, people, people want to help you, right? They're, they're, they're on your side. When you do start building the product, it's great to release it. Uh, published and imperfect but then the next game is to keep refining it until it's excellent because i think mm -hmm. to scale the business the product or offer has to be brilliant mm. no i agree with you i think you're definitely um like a role model i guess or like inspiration for people who want to leave their traditional jobs behind and build digital freedom what do you wish more people knew about that journey? First and foremost, the best outcomes are delayed. And a lot of people kind of expect results in three months when in reality it should be three years. And yeah. that's myself included. You know, the I made the start a lot harder because the expectation. And I, I ended up just saying to my girlfriend, you know what, F it. We're just going to do this for two years without monitoring the result. And that helped a lot. I guess the other thing, actor, is um, there's this meme on Twitter that you don't need a useless degree to be a creator or whatever or to make money online. Really misleading. because actually it's knowledge that sets you apart knowledge and skill and the creator thing is the whole tip of the iceberg right you want to get paid for your ideas but what you don't realize is marketing copywriting storytelling product building these are all things that you can go and learn mm -hmm. and um an idea i'm really fond of from nathan barry is that there isn't actually a limit on how fast you learn when it's self-educated right it's just your time and you can go pretty hard with that and so yeah. the reason why i'm here now is because a lot of intensity at the start yeah. right. quit tv every weekend every evening every early morning um a lot of intensity at the start but it's worth every effort right because now my day is usually four hours of writing calls in the afternoon time off whenever you want it all that good stuff that people you know, try to suck you in with, but it takes a lot of work. It's work, it's worth every effort. That's kind of what I'd like to say. No, I like that. Um, amazing. I'm going to end with a quick fire round. So I'm going to ask you five questions that I ask every creator that comes on air, starting with what's your favorite thing about being a creator? Making an impact on other people. Nice. And what's something that gives you the most inspiration for what you write? Well, for me, it's reading. I love reading ideas from other people. And then the question I like to ask, you know, when like an idea pops up, you highlight it's not enough to just do that. You need to ask, what does this mean for me? Mm. I, like if I ever find that I'm struggling with writing, pick up a book for 10 minutes and actually you know be quite intentional and be like okay this is pretty cool what does that mean in my journey and then boom there's your content nice I like that I like how you've added the extra point as well about bringing it back to your your own journey um what's a tool that helps you as a creator hype fury for twitter convert it from allowed to say that for um email they've both been really useful uh, apart from that my entire business is built on notion I like how everyone says notion <laughs> it's so common yeah 
I, I was just I was doing Google Drive, Microsoft Word, all these things, and then um, yeah, we moved everything to Notion. So I don't even go on any other apps. I literally just write on Notion, click a button, VA goes and uploads it, all these sort of things. Very frictionless. I think that's really important for creativity. So yeah, agreed. And what's something that helps with your creative work life balance? <laughs> My girlfriend. <laughs> <laughs> nice, I yeah. like that. I, I'm someone who enjoys work. And, you know, I enjoyed working as a dentist, even though I didn't like dentistry. So now that I write, if I had it my way, like I might end up working every day. Um, <laughs> but it's actually not congruent for creativity and inspiration, yeah. right? Like you need to step away from the keyboard. So, you know, my girlfriend and I love getting away. And, um, yeah, the relationship brings a nice balance to things. Good. And what's one piece of advice that you'd give to other creators? Apart from what we've spoken about, uh, I'm obviously a little biased, but learning to write well, I feel like the internet is the whole point in the internet is to be able to attract people that you can help and your ideas don't suck. It's just the way you package them. Yeah. And having a three to six month sprint on copywriting and taking the craft seriously will then let people trust you. You can build trust at scale if you can write a good story, for example, and then you can build the business that you really want. So take writing seriously. I think that's really, that's a good point. And I think it's applicable to almost any medium. So even like YouTubers writing better scripts and like Instagram writing better captions. So I think any creator can definitely take that advice on board. Yeah. Thank you, Kieran. This has been an amazing conversation. It's been so nice hearing your journey into the writing world and how you're building your business by being very real and authentic. So thank you for coming on air. That's been my pleasure. Thanks for having me. If you're a creator and you offer sponsorships, check out Passion Fruit. We help you to streamline your entire workflow. I'll see you in the next one. <laughs>